Developed by Rare and released in 1998, Banjo-Kazooie was one of the definitive titles for the Nintendo 64. While it received a remaster in 2008 that was released digitally on the Xbox 360, and later included on the Rare Replay compilation for Xbox One, we'll be reviewing the original. This is your standard 3D platformer collectathon, which builds upon the formula established two years prior by Super Mario 64. It has a similarly generic damsel in distress plot set up by the opening cutscene in which a witch, see what I did there, named Gruntilda, kidnaps the sister of one of the protagonists, something he sleeps right through, because a talking cauldron said that she was prettier, an obvious Snow White homage. It's really a shame that these cookie-cutter stories were still being used in the Nintendo 64 era. I don't expect or even want an intricate plot in a mascot platformer, but it would have been nice to have something less stock. As soon as you start playing, though, you realize that it doesn't really matter much because the game is great. The tutorial level, presented by Bottles the Mole, is done perfectly. It's short, sweet, and to the point. Shows you all the basic moves in a non-condescending way in appropriate situations, and gives the experienced player an option to skip it. These may seem like unimportant details, but every tutorial should be done exactly like this. Too many games screw them up. You play as both Banjo the Bear and Kazooie, the bird in his backpack who aids with certain moves and provides comedic relief. Right at the start, you're able to jump and hover, backflip, swim underwater, climb trees and poles, punch, roll, do this sliding stab attack, and this jumping pecking attack. Other moves are taught in subsequent levels, and learning them is required to progress through the game. After the tutorial is over, you enter Grunty's lair. It serves as the game's hub area, much like Peach's Castle in Super Mario 64. As stated earlier, this is a collectathon, and the two main collectibles are jigsaw puzzle pieces, known as jiggies, which allow you to unlock new levels, and music notes, which open doors allowing you to access different parts of Grunty's lair until you eventually reach Grunty herself at the top. Music notes are scattered throughout the levels, much like coins in Super Mario or gems in Spyro the Dragon, whereas jiggies are either hidden in challenging to reach locations or acquired by completing various challenges. There are 10 jiggies found in each level, and they, of course, are this game's equivalent to Super Mario 64's Power Stars. Some of the jiggies are very well hidden and require extensive exploration to find. There's also quite a bit of variety in the challenges, ranging from things like defeating bosses, winning races or other timed challenges, doing fetch quests, solving puzzles, collecting all five of the lost Jingo creatures found in each of the levels, or finding a hidden witch switch to trigger an event back in the hub world to find a Jiggy there. That's just one of the many secrets there are to find in Grunty's lair. Grunty's sister can be found in certain locations to refill your health, and to give you bizarre factoids about Grunty. You'd think that this was just filler and poor attempts at one-liner jokes, but you should pay attention to them. They'll come in handy later. Back to the music notes. Getting all 100 of them in each level is probably the most frustrating aspect of the core gameplay, because it must be done all on one life, much like the 100 coin missions in Super Mario 64. It can be pretty rage-inducing to make it close, only to lose a life and have to start all over. Other collectibles include the honeycomb pieces, which grant you an additional hit point for every six you collect, and mumbo tokens, which give off a very satisfying sound effect every time you grab one. Many of the levels contain a badass looking skull hut where Mumbo the Shaman lives. You exchange the tokens here in order to be transformed into various creatures, and also an anthropomorphic pumpkin. The transformations are necessary for collecting all notes and jiggies each level has to offer. For the most part, all of these extra characters are fun to play as, fit their levels theme well, and add more layers to the gameplay. Some areas you can access in both forms, but are easier to deal with as your alter ego, and sometimes it's necessary to transform before you interact with certain NPCs. Speaking of the levels, all of them are phenomenal. Really, there's not even one that I dislike, and that's pretty rare for a platformer. 
Each one is totally unique in its atmosphere and offers wildly different environments and challenges. There are even some recurring characters throughout the levels to add to the world building, as well as each level's enemies being unleashed into the hub area after you visit them, which really makes the world of the game feel like it's living and breathing. All of the music tracks are great too. They have a Saturday morning cartoon quality to them, appropriate for a mascot platformer. And the composers achieved quite a lot given the limitations of the cartridge format. As mentioned before, bottles can be found in most of the levels and he teaches additional moves that are required to collect many of the necessary items and reach previously unreachable parts of the castle. This is where the only major flaw of the game becomes apparent. There are too many control schemes, and it's extremely rare for a game with this many to do all of them well. You can fly with Kazooie on special platforms, with red feathers acting as ammo, and this causes the second level, Treasure Trove Cove, to be a major difficulty spike. The flight control is very floaty, and I never could quite get the hang of it. It becomes even worse when you learn the Beak Bomb, the only way to attack certain enemies such as these annoying as hell snowmen in Freeze Easy Peak. It's mandatory to take them all out before you do anything else, since they're constantly pelting you with snowballs. I hate these guys. The timing of the beak bomb is just weird, and I never felt truly in control of it. The swimming controls are also not precise at all, which leads a lot of people to hate the third level, Clanker's Cavern. I quite enjoyed it though, despite the need for copious swimming. It's really well designed and has lots of cool secrets. I just wish the color palette was less drab. It's possible to make a dumpy looking atmosphere without relying on black, brown, and washed out shades of other colors. Then there's the eggs, your projectile weapon. They can be annoying, because again there is not much precision, but in this case that's less the game's fault and more so the fault of the N64 joystick. Back in these days, there was a lot less space between 0 and 100. I imagine the Xbox version of the game is much better in this regard. Various events and challenges require you to poop eggs as well, which is... strange. I'm gonna have to agree with Kazooie on this one. Even the backflip is quite floaty and takes time to get used to, and you'll need to get used to it because it's required for some of the platforming. There are also gold feathers which grant invincibility. They run out really quickly and you can only hold 10 at a time, but they're so satisfying. The only bummer is that I don't always think about them in the heat of the game. Too many control schemes can't hamper the fun too much though. Almost everything here is just filled to the brim with charm. To compensate for the lack of sound capabilities on cartridges, all of the characters speak in these funny little voices that remind me of Charlie Brown's teacher and they're impossible to dislike. Gruntilda is of course an extremely generic villain, but her laugh is just perfect. And she periodically taunts you throughout your adventure. The game is packed with good humor, from Mumbo accidentally turning you into a washing machine, to the endless snark from Kazooie. For the interest of speedrunners, there are also a lot of the good kind of glitches. It's fun to find and exploit these, just for the hell of it. This box boss fight here? It was kinda bullshit, so I glitched it. Click Clock Wood is one of the most interesting and creative concepts for a platformer level that I have ever seen. It's built around a massive tree and split into four parts that have to be unlocked one by one, with each part featuring the same environment in each of the four seasons. Many of the jiggy challenges here are events which take place over the passage of time, like this one, where you hatch a baby eagle in the spring, help him grow in the summer and fall by finding and feeding him caterpillars, and are rewarded for your efforts in the winter when he's all grown up. It's pretty infuriating to fall down the tree while you're scaling it, though. Unless you get lucky and land right on top of a jiggy like I did here. There's also the frustration that comes along with swimming through the freezing water, which takes away your health at twice the rate of normal water. Remember what I said about imprecise swimming controls? Despite being, I guess, for kids, this is not a game that holds your hand. 
I'd even go as far as to say that some things are too cryptic. I really would have never guessed that I'm supposed to peck out these ship windows. I had to rely on a walkthrough for some parts in order to make it to 100% completion. After you earn enough notes to progress your way to the top of the castle where Grunty resides, you compete in this demented quiz show where you progress through a game board and are asked various trivia questions pertaining mostly to the levels you've played. Some are very difficult, and you lose a hit point any time you miss one. There are also ones where you're either shown a screenshot or played an audio clip where you have to guess which levels they came from. I usually do a lot better on these. Then, there are the questions related to the little factoids that you heard from Grunty's sister, so I hope you talked to her and committed what she said to memory. Some spaces on the board trigger a timed challenge, which are more difficult versions of the various jiggy challenges from earlier in the game. You can take many different paths on the board, so strategy is important. You want to avoid as much as possible the skull spaces, which are instant death if you get the questions wrong. And you want to land on the joker spaces in the corners, because you have the opportunity to earn skips here, which come in handy at the end where several skull spaces are laid in a row. This level is hard really hard, but I quite like it. I can't think of another game with a final boss encounter like this, where there's no actual fight, except it's not actually the final boss. After you win the quiz show and rescue the damsel, you get a fake ending cutscene before being told that you actually have to go and fight Grunty. It takes most of the notes and jiggies in the game to reach this part of the castle. Grunty is a marathon boss, meaning that there are several portions to the fight with her which must all be completed on one life. I usually find this to be tedious, but it wouldn't be a problem here if the fight didn't make extensive use of the worst aspects of the game's control. It starts off simple enough, just dodging Grunty's dive bomb attacks, but then you have to shoot eggs at her while she's tossing endless exploding fireballs your way. It's hard to get into a rhythm here because you have a really small window of time where she isn't firing away. You'd think you could use the platforms as shields, but that's unreliable. And standing on them, which you must do, results in these nonsense reverse knockback deaths way too often. The egg shooting precision was already shoddy, but here it's tough to get the correct angle because of the weird viewpoint and the structure of the castle. Once you get past that, which despite some annoyances really isn't that hard, you have to get in the sky for one of the most frustrating gaming experiences I have ever had. Seriously. As I've said before, the flight controls, much like the swimming controls, are just bad. They're so floaty, and the beak bombing is so imprecise. I couldn't get the timing down for the life of me, and I died way more times than I care to admit. As a shitty bonus, misfiring in this stage can lead to moments like this. Once you hit her enough times, which feels like an eternity, the Jingos you helped throughout the game come out of the ground like the Avengers out of the portals in a delightfully corny moment where they vow to help their friend Banjo by kamikazeing Grunty after you fire enough eggs into their statues. This part isn't that hard at all, but if you happen to run out of eggs, you're screwed, because you are not going to have time to run around and collect more. Sometimes, tough challenges in video games lead to fist-pumping moments where I feel satisfied and proud of what I've just worked so hard to accomplish. Others leave me on the couch with my arms crossed and a scowl on my face, still angry even after I've triumphed. This final boss fight falls into the latter category. I was seething as I watched Grunty tumble to the ground like an 80s cliché, because the difficulty here does not come from fair challenge, but rather from unrefined game mechanics. Persevering and beating her didn't even feel worth it. It would have been nice to get a bonus level for 100% completion like in Spyro and many other games, but no. The final cutscene featuring weird hints about the game's upcoming sequel is the only reward for collecting all of the notes and jiggies and defeating Grunty. While this game is undeniably great for all of the reasons I've detailed throughout the video and more, this playthrough was the first and last time I will ever complete it 100%. I'll definitely play it more in the future, because I love most of it, but I will never fight Grunty again. 
nor will I ever compete in either of these bullshit races again. Back to what I said earlier, it has one major flaw, and that is too many control schemes. When a game has this many ways to play, the odds of all of them being fine-tuned enough for consistently smooth gameplay is really low. It's sort of like when a restaurant has too many items on the menu. There's no way all of them will be good. But aside from that one major flaw, all of my complaints about the game are minor nitpicks. Why am I showed a game over screen every time I save? That makes no sense. It also makes no sense that Banjo stepping on a floorboard wakes up this ghost but Kazooie's cawing doesn't. And why are the red feathers placed on the red parts of this slide, and the gold music notes placed on the gold parts? That makes them hard to see. You get the point. This game has great visuals, great characters, great music, great world building, great platforming, and great exploration and trinket hunting. It's an N64 classic, and you should definitely play it. But if the final boss frustrates you too much, just quit, okay? I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing, leaving a thumbs up, sharing, and ringing the bell so you don't miss any future videos. This has been a Leaky Faucet Review. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Thank you.